Hey, thank you so much for joining us today at Cowboy Junction Church Online. We're sure glad that you did. We hope that today's message will encourage you and challenge you as you connect passionately with the word that God has specifically for you. Would you do me a big favor, rate, review, and subscribe to this message. Also, I wanna let you know that if you would like to connect with Cowboy Junction, get our text messages and with encouragement and announcements, you can do so by texting the word CONNECT to 575-209-2770. You could also rate, review, and subscribe. That sure would be helpful to us. If you would like to partner with Cowboy Junction in the spreading of the gospel by financially giving, you can do so by going to cowboyjunctionchurch.com slash give. I hope you enjoy the message. I want to once again turn to our online campus and welcome you guys and gals watching. Maybe you're watching from uh, your campground in, uh, in, uh, in Cloudcroft, Mayhill, New Mexico, maybe from Oklahoma, uh, wherever you are today. We come together to uh, uh, celebrate our Lord Jesus, right? But it happened to fall on Sunday this year. Let me just tell you, as a pastor, I'd really rather preach uh, a message. I, I'm, I'm not comfortable uh, preaching on, on, on when the holidays like this fall on, uh, on, our, on our Sunday, but I think God's got us ready for this. Yeah. So uh, would, you, would you bow me in prayer? Would you bow me in prayer? I mean, this isn't starting <laughs> off right. Here we go. Would you bow in prayer? Pray hard, folks. Here we go. <laughs> Jesus, we need you. Yes. We love you. We thank you. Our hearts have already been touched through worship and this incredible prayer we've already prayed. And now, Lord, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would lead and direct. And Father, I pray this message would reflect everything you put in my heart as we spent time together and we talked and you told me what you wanted me to talk about. Lord, I pray that this message would go into the hearts of your people. For anyone that could be hard-hearted, and I, I know what that feels like, God. I know what it feels like to be hard-hearted. I just pray that you would just loosen us up right now. I thank you. I love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I told you I was going to speak, preach a message on In God We Trust. And, and that's what today's title of the message is. In God We Trust. But, you know, as you look at things, the United States of America doesn't seem too united right now. Would you agree? It just, it just, I mean, just be all, I'm not being negative. I'm not trying to point fingers who faults it is or anything like that. But the United States of America seems very separated, divided. And, and let me just tell you that one of the things that I've been looking at in, is what does it mean to say in God we trust? In fact, let me, let me just kind of reach in my pocket real quick here. And, and one of the things that I notice on the back of our bill as it says, in God we trust. I'm going to ask you a question. And this question has a lot to do with the direction this message is going to go. The question I have is, what was the first thing that came to your mind when I said, in God we trust? And for a lot of us, the first thing that comes to mind is money. It's the first thing that enters our head. It's because it's written on the back of every one of our dollars. No matter the numerical figure, it says, in God we trust. But do you know that many, many, many years ago, when our forefathers put together this nation, it wasn't the economic side of in God we trust that they meant. It was the religious side of in God we trust that they meant. They truly, truly felt like God had established in their hearts something that was special and unique and wonderful a chance at life that really, honestly, very few people had ever got, like they were getting. A new land, a new country, a place to where they were going to be separated from, an old king in an old way of doing uh, life and stepping into a new way. And they approached us from the standpoint of, how does God want us to set up and establish this great nation that we're going in? The United States of America. The reason why I wanted to pull out the dollar a minute ago is because in all the laws and all the rights that our forefathers began to write down, only one was written to where it said that we will have taxation. There will be no taxation without representation. I bet if I turned to a lot of people and said, why did we separate ourselves from England? 
you would say, well, because of taxation without representation, then we shouldn't have it. I mean, there you go. But do you know that, that was far down the list from other amendments and other constitutional rights that they said every, every human has these things and begin to show the freedoms that they believed God gave us and made us special as a nation. So I want to stop real quick. Remember the dollar I pulled out a minute ago? Let me now introduce to you the statements that I want to make at the very beginning here. And this is to ruffle our feathers a little bit. In fact, let me just tell you. And on our Thursday, Iron Men, 6.30 in the morning, all the guys got together and were studying a portion of Scripture. I said to them what I'm about to say to you, because I wanted to at least to have 20 men mad at me, then the whole church mad at me, okay? And I knew if it was wrong, then, then all of a sudden I could change my message and it wasn't too late. I could talk 20 guys to coming back by taking them to Rose's, and, uh, and it would be, it'd be wonderful. But we all sat there and stewed on it and chewed on it. And I turned to them, I said the very same thing I turned to you. United, the United States of America doesn't feel very united right now. Would you agree? Right. And they all agreed. And I said, but the funny thing is, is that right now, there is a lot of money to be made on the far right. If you're far right, if, if, you're, if you're red, 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 if you're on the far right, red side, there's some people that would love nothing more than to scare us put fear in our hearts, put doubt in our mind, make us question everybody but us. Don't you want to be on our side? Don't you want to be over here? And there's a whole lot of money to be made on the far right. And there's a whole lot of money to be made on the far left. Who are they to tell us what to do? This is a free nation. You can be whoever you want to be. You can be whatever you want to be with whoever you want to be with, with, with. There's a lot of things that you, there's a reason why we're blue. There's a reason why we're on the left. This is the American way. And there's a lot of money to be made on the far right and the far left. But can I turn to you and tell you what I told the men on Thursday? There has never been one problem ever solved on the planet on the far right or the far left. You don't amen me today, by the way. Don't say anything. And the reason why is because I'm not sure it's soaking in. And if you amen what I just said, I, I want to make sure you get what I'm saying. Because there are people giving their life for the fact that they think problems can be solved on the right. And they think, there's people in this room, they're going, I, I, I think the problem with America is more America needs to be on the left, and we can solve problems on the left. But I'm going to turn to you and tell you this. You're going to hear today, there has never been one problem ever saw, solved on the far right or the far left. And can I turn and tell you this? Jesus isn't even on the right, right. or the left. <laughs> this is the part where all the guys... 20 of them, sitting at Iron Man, went, hmm, and took their donut, <laughs> put it in their mouth. We chewed on it. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because I think the unity where problems are solved happens when we come together. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I want you to take a look at the greatest example of kingdom living we have ever had in our entire existence on the planet, and his name was Jesus. And Jesus wasn't on the right, and he wasn't on the left. And to give you an example, what makes Jesus so fascinating to me is that Jesus came as the Son of God to earth, and he was right smack dab in the middle of an, a temple that was asking him to be everything they thought the Messiah should be. And he was stuck right smack down in the middle of the Roman Empire who was asking him just to be quiet, let us do our thing. All you have to do is just be quiet, just be quiet. And Jesus stayed right in the middle and he brought salvation to the world, to the world. Not because he was this way or this way, but he was right in the middle so that he could be the example of where we do solve problems. And the only place we ever solve problems, the only place where people can come together is when we meet in the middle. Now, that's going to make somebody mad in the room. They haven't even heard the message today because we don't meet with anybody unless they are on our side. Our side. And that's not how Jesus lived. 
In fact, today I want to show you, after looking at, at, at people that are way smarter than me, I could not have preached this message on my own. For weeks and weeks and weeks, I have been looking at men and women who are way smarter than me and lining up if they were trying to pull me to a side or not or who was directing me towards what God wanted for America. And did I have enough faith to believe that it's in God I trust to know that I won't be pulled this way or this way, but I will step towards my Father's plans and where are the problems going to be solved? So I thought it'd be fun today. Y'all ready to do something fun? Let's take everything I just talked about. Let's take it up here. We'll put a pin in it. We're going to come back to it in a minute. But for some of us, we need a history lesson. Now, for all the young people in the room, let me just tell you, my least favorite mess, uh, uh, class in all of history was history. history. That's right. All the history professors in the room, if you would have just taken the dates out, I would have done a lot better. That's for me, 1776 was no different than 1775. I don't know. That's just how I walk. That's just how, I, how I roll. And let me tell you, there's an amazing thing that every young person, I mean, every young person, you don't need to push away history. You don't need to shove it out of the way. Can I just tell you, there's going to be a point in your life where you start appreciating it more and more. For me, the Bible began to unfold more and more because it was not only a history lesson, but it was the way of life. And then I learned this valuable thing about history. We can't know where we're going to go unless we learn from where we've been. And so all of these things, as a leader, I begin to think about, have we ever experienced this as a, as a nation before? What is God doing as a nation? Where are we going as a nation? Where do we come from as a nation? And there are some fascinating things. And I'm going to tell you, one of the coolest trips you'll ever take in your life, and I highly recommend every family do it, go to Washington, D.C. I highly recommend it. Um, there are people who take mission trips to Africa, and it's so wonderful. But you know, one of the greatest mission trips you'll ever take is for your own nation and go learn our history at Washington, D.C. I got to see the uh, Declaration of Independence with my own eyes. That's not what you think it is. It, it's a great big piece of paper that you can't even read anymore. You can't even read the writing anymore. It's amazing. You need to go to the Holocaust Museum. You need to go to different museums and check it out. It's not boring. It's very exciting. It's very cool. But one of the things you should read and get to know is the Bill of Rights. Let me show you the Bill of Rights real quick. You ready? The Bill of Rights goes like this. It's, it's simply the rights that our forefathers believed you have as a living, breathing human. Okay? Now, they came from an experience that we all have appreciated from. They have come from England that told you how things were going to be done, and they took what they felt like were your rights away from you. But our forefathers being wise, and our forefathers knowing God's plan for our life, said these are some things that I think every American should have. You should have the freedom of speech. No one should ever tell you that you can't speak up and speak out against injustice. You should, every person, have the freedom of speech. We'll come back to this in a minute. The freedom of press. Now, this seems to blow your mind a little bit. You're like, how, were, how did they know that we would be at a place where we question the freedom of press? Back then, they held the press at a standard of expecting them to always be able to communicate to the American citizens truth, what was happening, what was not happening, and there should never be limitations on what the press sh should print because of the truth the American people need. We're going to get to all this in a minute. All this is really cool. The freedom to assembly. Many, many years ago, the king felt like over a certain number of people, it was unhealthy. And you couldn't meet over, you could meet with your friends over a certain amount of people because they felt like it would turn into a mob or a riot or quite possibly an army. And, 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 and they began to couple these... Um, freedoms together, because that also fell in the whole area of freedom of religion. That you as an individual created by God and you as an individual have the ability to hear from God and we have leaders that God puts into place to be able to coach us on what does scripture tell us, not what the king tells us and tells us what we can believe, what we can't believe, but what does scripture teach us to be able to come together in this, as assembly to print the literature needed for 
godly people to continue to grow in their relationship with him, to be able to speak the truth, even if it doesn't line up with leadership. If a leader begins to, to, to step up like a king, does someone have the ability to have the freedoms to be able to speak up and say, that is not, that is not what's best for us and, or our nation or God's plan for our life. Uh, the right to bear arms. Rawr. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The right, the, right, the right to due process. Yeah, for everybody packing in the room, here's the room. Rules, number one, nobody wants to know. Okay, rule number one. Rule number two, don't aim this way. Okay, there you go, that wasn't funny. Okay, Bill of Rights, right to due process. The right to jury trial. These are all fascinating things. Don't just skip this stuff. There's a reason why our forefathers said this is a big deal. Jury trial is uh, pretty fascinating. Used to, they could say that you did something, they could lock you up, and you didn't know when your jury was going to take place, where your trial was going to take place. It was their way of just getting rid of, the, of you, where they didn't have to hear from you, hear from you, say any, you couldn't say anything, they just locked you up. Our forefathers said there has got to be a right for every American that if they've been accused of something, there's going to be a speedy trial to get to that immediately so that they can prove they're innocent if they're innocent. This is just forethought that was just amazing. A search and seizure, cruel and unusual punishment, not the right to cruel and unusual, but against, okay, just want to make sure we're there. But the quartering of soldiers was pretty fascinating. Back in the day, if, uh, if the Navy landed and no one had a place to stay, they could just come through your front door, throw someone out of their bed, sleep in your bed, because they were the military and they needed a place to live. And many people had to serve the military in England because... Uh, the soldiers had the rights above the citizens. They served the king. And someone said, hey, we need to make sure that my property is my property and my house is my house. And the, the, the soldiers don't, we don't serve the soldiers. The soldiers, are, they serve the civilians. And when we read this, we think to ourselves, what does that have to do with today? And that's what's interesting, is that some of us would look at these Bill of Rights and think they have nothing to do with us anymore, and they use quartering of soldiers as an example. That has no meaning in today's day and age. It's fascinating, it's there, but the reason why I want to put it there today is because it now brings up a lot of questions we have in today's day and age. With the older generation that just valued these, and the younger generation who questions these rights. And, and I, I know that many of us need to pause and look at this more often. Because our forefathers knew that these rights in their days are so unexplanatory. They're, everybody gets it. But hundreds of years from now, we, we may not get it. So, our forefathers put together the Ninth Amendment. I'm going to read the Ninth Amendment to you, Okay. Now, there are people in the room that, because I just mentioned the Ninth Amendment, just immediately went, ugh. Because this is the Ninth Amendment that everybody's like, oh, crud. Don't read that. I don't read that in church, and you'll see why, okay? Let me read it to you. The Ninth Amendment, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be constructed to deny or disparage others, other rights retained by the people. Did you get it? No. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. The Ninth Amendment, if you were to put it in layman's terms, and let me just tell you, this isn't my definition, but this is the definition that most Americans are going off of after we just read the rights that we know that we have. But what about the rights that, that we're going to think of in the future? Here's how you would define the Ninth Amendment. It's the right. This is what most people would say, okay? It's the right to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, as long as it doesn't interfere with anyone else's rights. And you know what I love about this? I love it because it tells us there's no way our forefathers would have known everything our nation is going to go through. But it is the definition of a right that actually will take away all of our freedoms if we read it like this. One of my favorite guys... Um, in the Constitution, wrote it, uh, an amazing leader, um, John Adams, began to coach us on um, what he knew we would experience someday. John Adams said this, I want you to check this out. Individual rights must be coupled with individual responsibilities. 
I call a big time out here. This is the part where I'm going to start pulling people together. We've come here today to see the United States of America to come back to the unity that it's supposed to be. Yeah. And what I want to paint a picture, if you're, if you're in this room and you're like, I am diehard, 100% pro-Jesus, go team Jesus, I am for God, in God, God rescued me, I'm glad you're here. If you're in this room and you're like, I don't even know about this Jesus thing. I'm still struggling. I got so many questions. I mean, like, what about the dinosaurs? And it just seems like you guys are so narrow-minded. I mean, what the heck, man? And, but, but I'm interested. It's like every now and then something good will come out of your mouth. Like every now and then I come to church and it goes, blah, 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 Jesus. And it's like, yes, yes, let's do more of that. And so it's 30 minutes of nothing and 15 minutes of good stuff, okay? I know. I've been there. I've been there. The reason that our rights work, John Adams says, is first of all, we have to realize if we don't carry our responsibilities, we don't get privileges. And you know what? Maybe you grew up with parents that taught you this. Parents who turned to you and said, everybody has responsibilities. Because the individual rights must be coupled with individual responsibilities. And if any point we begin to be a nation that only preaches the rights that we have, and you don't preach the responsibilities that come with it, we all lose our liberties and our rights. Can you imagine living in a house when it was all rights and no responsibilities? Maybe you grew up in this house, and that may be your problem. My mom and dad, they preach, we're, not, we're for privileges. But son, you got to get your responsibilities first. And this was a huge part, because let me tell you why this is such a big deal. This is, this is my interpretation. Liberties, apart from responsibility, actually undermine liberties. So for everybody that's like, I like freedom. I like to just, don't tell me what to do. I want to go where I want, how I want, wherever I want, to do whatever I want to do. I, I'm glad you feel the freedom to do it, but can I just be honest? Be honest. Come on, look at me, look at me. That's not how your house even works. And if it does, and this is real, this is so real. For the 17-year-old sitting there going, I'm just not listening. Well, you've got to listen because you won't want to raise your kids that way. And there are responsibilities that we have in every one of us that we've got to start leaning in because liberty, apart from responsibility, it actually takes all of our freedoms away. Every one. Everyone. And this is my first point. It kind of wakes us up a little bit. Because everybody loves laws, right? Don't you love laws? No. No, there isn't anybody. <laughs> there isn't anybody who loves laws. I don't love laws. You don't love laws. I would just like it if there were no laws. You know how much fun that would be? There's a great book you need to read. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Great Divorce. Okay? This is just like a side note. Go with me here. You go, you ready? Here we go. Uh, it's an old book. It's an old book. C.S. Lewis is one of the coolest authors ever. And he wrote this book called The Great Divorce. And you know what it was about? Hell. Yeah, you're like, that doesn't sound fun. Oh, just go with me. You're going to love it here in a minute. This is great. But he wrote about hell in a way that no one has ever heard of before. Like, he wrote about hell, okay? And it had no little demons in it. And it had no Satan in a onesie carrying it on a pitchfork. <laughs> You know, it, there were no flames in this book. It was all about hell, and it had, was, it had no flames in it whatsoever. You know what he said hell was like? And this is just his own interpretation of what hell was like. He said hell is getting everything you want. He said hell is you thinking about everything and instantly, whatever you want, whatever you want, what ever you want pops up just instantly and some of us would say that sounds like heaven and c.s lewis then spun it and added decades and years and forever to the story and he said what ends up happening is everything you ever want ends up being nothing you thought it was gonna be wow. this is a great book for everybody in the room that you just love your freedoms and love your liberties, you may get everything you want, but it's not going to be what you thought it was going to be. It could actually be 
hell. And, and, and let me show you why laws, laws don't work. The reason why I bring this up is because we, we'll make a law there, we'll make a law, let's make a law. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll just keep our freedoms, but we'll just make these little laws along the way to kind of direct everybody. But we'll check this out. You can't legislate responsibility. Amen. That's good. You can't. That's good. So it's like all these people getting to do whatever they want to do, and they say, well, more laws will fix it. More laws will fix this nation. No, it won't. Because you can't legislate doing what? you're supposed to do. You can't make a better mom by making more rules. You can't make a better dad by making more rules. You can't make a better American by making more rules. Okay, there's a reason why I'm pointing at all this, okay? Here's the reason why. Remember, I, I talked about John Adams a minute ago. Let me give you one of my favorite quotes. John Adams said this, guys, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of others. So let me just say real quick, if you're in this room and you're like, oh, there it is. Mom wanted me to come today and I came and now I'm, I'm mad. I am not eating her potato salad when I get back to her house. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to sit at the dinner table like this all day long. Quit. Stop. There's a reason why. I'm not trying to get you saved. I'm not trying to get you to come to church. Just trust me. I am your friend named Ty. Okay? Some call me Squints. You can't. <laughs> How did we become in a United States of America? How did we become one of the coolest places to live with some of the coolest views of liberty and law? It's because the men who put this all together admitted uh, we could make the best examples of what liberty is and freedom. We can say you have an undeniable human right to do this and an undeniable human right to do this. But can we just be honest and say, I, I bet 200 and some odd years from now, if everybody loses the moral fiber that directs us as the founders of America and the complete dependency upon our Lord Jesus Christ and his truth, his way, and his life, in the future, everything we put together is just going to be inadequate for anybody that lives their life any other way. And it's a timeout moment. Because a minute ago we set the establishment that, okay, Privileges without responsibility ends up to us losing our liberty. John Adams goes further and says, we're actually governed by a higher calling. And that's what this is about. More laws don't make a better America. A higher law, one that man can't put together, a one that man didn't come up with, is actually the first thing that establishes all the other things. But if we don't have it, we won't have anything. I mean, let me just say this real quick. You ready? We're all entitled to, you ready? Let me show you, rights. And we're all wanting more laws. And rights give us what we're entitled to. And law, well, it tells us what we're allowed to do. And let me tell you about this. For everybody in the room that says, I want more laws, all the question is, is, okay, tell me what I can do. And the moment they tell us what we can do, we get our tape measure out and we figure out the bare minimum we need to do in order to do the law. And I'll give you an example. All you suckers that know the speed limit and go five miles over the speed limit, prove my point exactly. What's the speed limit? And I'm going to go that much more. And you go, hey, officer, I followed the law. Well, what if there was no law? What if nobody, what, what, what if we didn't, and we blame everybody else on something that we need to go back to and realize we have rights. And laws, laws are there to protect us. But the greatest example of what really directs our lives as people and our nation as a government is the law of Christ. Okay? 
Now, I didn't know what the law of Christ was my entire life. Grew up in church, was raised in church, saw all kinds of Jesus things and grew up in, with Jesus and my mom knew Jesus and but I didn't know what the law of Christ was. And I remember when I was in Phoenix, I never forget, someone asked me, well, it's just the law of Christ. And I had to raise my hand and say, well, what's the law of Christ? And, and, and the law of Christ is when Jesus turned and he says, guys, listen, everything, everything that you know from the Old Testament covenant can really be summed up in two things. Yeah. Two things. And this is Jesus talking. You figure he'd come and say, hey, keep them all. And you had to go study them all. And Jesus turned and said, no, I'm going to make this simple. Number one, number one, you ready? If you got your Bibles out, if you didn't know, okay, write this down on the front cover. You'll find it all throughout the New Testament. Jesus turns, just simply, turns and simply says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He, he didn't say join a church. He didn't say honor tie during Pastor Appreciation Month. He did not say any of that. He didn't say uh, download our ties podcast. Uh, you friend him on Instagram. He never said anything about a pastor. Never said anything about a church. He just simply said, "Guys, you're going to know what to do, where to do it, and how to do it if you can just honor the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength." Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead and give you the second one. You ready? He said, and the second one is just like it. You ready? Love, uh, love your neighbor yeah. as yourself. If you love the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you will keep every law Moses gave you. Right. I want to go back to this. Look what John, Quincy, oh, John, John Adams said. He said, our constitution was made up for moral and religious people. Let me just stop real quick. This is a reminder for everybody. I don't care where you start. I don't care if you have your own way of thinking and you're doing it your way and you don't like being told what to do and is, you, you would say, Ty, it's so far from the way my grandmother would have defined a Christian. Rain on your grandma right now. Yeah, if she was here, I wouldn't say that, but she's not here. So rain on your grandma. And here's, because I'm just asking you to start where you're at. And for everybody in the room to say, I was raised in church. I was born in church. I have such a problem with, it. like you said middle a minute ago, and it bugged me. Because ever since I was little, you either got on the right or the left, or God will spew you out of his mouth on the middle. I know you know just enough of the Bible to, to, to scare me. Okay? But that's not what God was saying. God was saying, listen, I need you to do the same thing I'm, exact, I'm asking them to do. I need both of you to take one step closer to where I am. Will you take one step closer to me? And if we can love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, and we can serve the Lord with all of our heart, mind, and strength, the government, the laws that we've established in Americans will begin to make sense more and more. Let me tell you why. You ready? When we follow God and we serve God with our thinking, when we serve God with our mouth, when we serve God with our heart, the freedom of speech begins to make sense more, doesn't it? Because for everybody that says, I want to say whatever I want to say. I want to do whatever I want to say. I want to do whatever I want to do. And then you begin to serve God with your mouth and they give you the microphone. You don't say what's in your head because your heart's guarding your words. Because people matter. Freedom of press. From religion. All of these laws begin to make sense because of a moral and religious precedence if i'm taking one step closer to god whether i'm coming from the left or from the right all of a sudden my freedoms begin to make more sense jesus said this for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command love your neighbor as yourself Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is the greatest example, the greatest example of what it means to want God's kingdom on earth. To honor one another means to care for one another, to be patient with one another, to forgive one another. Can I just turn to tell you, 
the way that we come back and meet in the middle might have to do with a lot of forgiveness. And you don't have the ability to forgive as a human. It's not in you. It's not a part of your nature. There's a warring nature inside every one of us. We want to be over in the polar opposite. We want to be somewhere else. We want to be right and them wrong. But what forgiveness is, is God saying, weren't you far from me at one time? And I forgave you. And I made a way where you didn't have a way. And it causes us to take one step closer. Jesus won't be found on the ends. And problems won't be found, problems won't be answered on the ends. But it's only when we meet in the middle will the problems be solvable. Now, for, for the person that are in, like, I don't want to compromise. Did I, did I say compromise? I never once said compromise. But wouldn't you agree, whichever side we come from, if we're choosing to serve the Lord, to want what God wants for our life, we can take one step closer to Him, which actually brings one step closer to each other. Can I give you some examples? Let me give you some examples. There are sides that abortion is a real issue, huge issue. It's like I will not be linked up with somebody that's going to kill a baby. I won't be. I won't be. And there's other sides that would say, I don't want to be told what I can do, what I can't do. This is my body. And can I turn to you and tell you that if we stay there, there will be no solutions. So how do you meet in the middle? That is one of the things that I think our church has been so fun at is we have turned and said mama and she turns and she goes you <laughs> she's having a baby and she can't take care of it and the only option she hears is abortion but then she has this Christian in her life other Christian in her, in her life and say we have been praying for a baby and all of a sudden two people begin to walk towards each other and this person turns and says will you please carry that baby to term, the full term. We'll pay for everything. In fact, we have a whole church behind us backing us to pay for this delivery, to pay for this child, and we will be the best mama and daddy this child could ever want. And all of a sudden, abortion is defeated because adoption became real. And two people can hate each other and no problems get solved. Or two people can meet in the middle and we can solve some problems not because we stayed right or we stayed left, but we stayed and met in the middle. Amen. Can I turn to all of my gay and lesbian friends? Can I turn to you and say, I am so sorry and I apologize for the way the church has treated you over the years. I have some deep personal beliefs. I have some things that are non-negotiable on my part. But can I turn to you and say, that if we can come together and you say, all I want is for what God wants for my life, that's a prayer I pray every day of my life too. And so as a pastor, can I, can I do something real quick? I want to promise you, and this is a way for me to come and meet you in the middle. This church will always be a safe place for you to come hear about God's plans for our life for our life. You won't be criticized. You won't be humiliated. You won't be talked down to. You just know, I'm taking one step closer to Jesus. Will you come with me? And as long as you come here, you will be protected. You will have friends. As long as we keep walking towards Jesus. Let's take one more step closer to Jesus. What does God want for our life? And if that's something you want, this will always be a home for you. And it's the, only, it's the way right now that I can, I can do that as a pastor. And if you can do that, we can pursue Jesus together. But nothing gets solved over there and nothing gets solved over there. If we can keep doing this, we will start seeing some things we've always wanted to see. Let me, let me wrap up like this. You ready? Guys, we got to learn how to do what, what's just 
and not what you can justify. Now just three points, three points. We have got to learn how to do what's just, what's right, what's kingdom, what's God's best for our life, what's God's will for our life. All of these things make the, make the freedoms we have as Americans make more sense. But can we just start doing what's just instead of doing what we can justify? Uh, this is just how a house is run. And, and this is what our forefathers said. This is how it works. Okay, second one. It's this. Uh, guys, can we do what's responsible and not what's permissible? And, and, and listen, I'm not just saying this. I have to do this all the time. There are a lot of things that I want to do, but I know that it does not lead to life or God's plan for my life. And I know your flesh is saying, this stinks. Do you realize your flesh is the very reason that we find ourselves in places that God's not? And, and when we start doing what's responsible instead of what's permissible, we begin to find ourselves in a place where more unity can be built to be able to be the people God's called us to be. And the third one, I love this one, this is so good, to do what's moral and not what's modeled. I mean, come on. Do you know, just as fast as you can sit here and go, man, I love that, that was so good. That tie's so awesome. That tie's so great, he's so cool. He dresses so good. Man. No, I, you could walk out of this room and someone can change your mind from something that God put in your mind so fast. And I want to turn to you and say, what if we begin to do what's moral, what's simply the right thing? And you're going to find that life has this thread and this thread of morality that can be found if you look for it. It can be found because God put it there is this life of morality not the life of being modeled because other people are going to show you how to live, how to do it. They'll make your decisions for you. And what if we do what's moral, not what's modeled? Gee, uh, in Galatians chapter 15, this is the Apostle Paul. And it's the last and final thing. We're done, okay? Last and final thing. Fabian's up here playing. Okay, he says this. He guys, guys, listen. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And this is what happens when we don't come together. And Paul was using this as an example with a bunch of rules. And there was people who wanted to keep the rules. And like, you got to be circumcised. you got to be circumcised. And Paul kept showing them, listen, your, law, your rules don't work. Your rules aren't working. We've got to jump into. We need Jesus. Circumcision doesn't change somebody's heart. Keeping rules doesn't change somebody's heart. Making more laws doesn't change somebody's heart. And then he warned him at the end. He said, if we keep this up, we're only going to bite and devour each other and beware lest you be consumed by another. We're going to eat you. Let me tell you, what humans bite each other? Children. Children. Stinking biters. And Paul's saying, if we keep acting like children, we're going to only eat up each other. And there's a place we take a step closer to the middle. And that's where problems get solved.